Uh, my name is Jeff Thies. I'm the clinical faculty of management and director of the Institute for Business Ethics and Sustainability. And along with Sheree Kuhn, we're honored to be able to both host and facilitate this event tonight and throughout the next few days. If there's anything that we can do for you in any way, please let us know. Really want you to experience our hospitality, and we're so really honored that you're here. Um, I'm going to present the speakers here in just a minute, but before I do that, I would like to introduce our Dean, Dean Dale Smith, who's going to begin with a few comments for us. Hi, everyone, and on behalf of the College of Business Administration, it is truly my honor and pleasure to also welcome you to our campus, the competition and the summit. And help me give a round of applause to Jeff Thies and his team, staff, my faculty colleagues, who are all here and so committed to sustainability. What I like to say is they put the courageous conversations that we need to be having in business, in leadership, and in disciplines around the university front and center, and that really is what they do. So much of what will be discussed this week is really a passion for all of us in the room, as well as my own colleagues in our school. And it's more than just our job, because it's fundamentally about stakeholders coming together and addressing the world's greatest challenges. That is, care for our common home, planet Earth. There's a lot of intentionality that's happening around the world, and a lot of good things are happening, but there's still so much work to do. And we need to unleash the power of the many voices, including business voices, to make a difference around the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And in the competition, I know all of the teams that are here are going to be talking about how business strategy can and must make a difference and really impact that triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit. But while business schools around the world are committed to making a societal impact, it's part of our accreditation requirements, it is not just about ticking the box, nor should it be for companies around the world. We're at a crossroads as a global community, and I can only imagine what happens when different disciplines come together and start working on these issues. So you hear phrases like the SDGs and CSR and ESG, and we're going to have a wonderful speaker tonight uh, speaking on those issues. But these are not just feel-good acronyms or alphabet soup. They're the kinds of things that make a difference. So let me provide a few examples and kind of set the stage so um, when Dan does come up and, and share items, I think it'll, it'll be helpful. Last month, I got to not be a dean. I got to be a faculty member, and I joined two of my colleagues. And we did a deep dive into the plastics and environmental strategy, plastics industry and environmental strategy, as part of our EMBER program. And we were in Tanzania and Kenya in East Africa, two emerging economies. It was an amazing trip. We had U.S. Embassy briefings. We met with NGOs. We met uh, a number of companies and, and social businesses trying to understand how the economy is both driving change and also where there are large gaps. It was wonderful to meet entrepreneurs in these areas who are bringing new direction to concepts related to plastics and the need to reduce, reuse, and recycle. And there's much to reflect on. But what really hit me during this trip and why I think this activity is so incredibly important, and particularly in Kenya, is that Kenya is a place with unlimited geothermal energy. It's a place that has bright, innovative ideas. And it, but I was deeply reflective of the lack of infrastructure, access to education, the plight of slums, impoverished communities without access to clean water, communities of food insecurity, and a host of SDG-related issues. Yet, it's one of the fastest growing populations on the globe, and how rarely we talk about the continent in places like Tanzania and Kenya. We need to be part of this global community. But one of the brighter visits of this was a company that I and the students and uh, the faculty had a chance to visit right outside of Nairobi called Ocean Soul Africa. Now this is a social business that's recycling flip-flops into major art. They were literally flipping the flop. The organization is changing today's plastics economy to a zero waste economy. They coordinate action from multiple stakeholders, and they push the boundaries of innovation in the sector. They're recycling a million flip-flops a year, over one ton of styrofoam a month, and they're contributing 10 to 15% of their revenue to environmental cleanup, vocational and educational programs, and conservation efforts. 
Their hard work is amazing. They pay bonuses to their employees. They're helping employees educate their children. They're helping their employees uh, buy land. And this isn't a place where there's 40% unemployment. And the artwork is amazing. Look them up, Google them. I must admit that our group of students and faculty spent a lot of money buying artwork in the gift shop. You know, what's fascinating to me is that they describe their business as being all about the community. They support men, women, and youth, fishermen, and other entrepreneurs that are part of an ecosystem. They're using the styrofoam and the plastic waste in the factory there, that where they're making the art, to stuff mattresses that are being used for refugees. In short, it's strong community engagement, and it's the core of their business and their art. And that's the kind of leadership we need, and it's the kind of leadership that we'll all be talking about over the next few days. New ways of thinking and the kind of innovation that addresses the world's most pressing issues. One more quick example, and then I promise Jeff I'll shut up. It's just I get passionate when I have all these people who care about the issues we do. So I was recently also in Delhi and Mumbai, India, as a delegate of the World Trade Center, uh, our mission to India. And India is one of the world's fastest growing economies. There's no shortage of issues needing to be addressed. And we were going to a number of companies, and in one visit to a company called Ypro, which is kind of like Tata, it's a leading technology services and consulting company. But we walked into their lobby, and there on a great big mural was the coolest phrasing I will never forget. It said, innovation begins where silos end and boundaries manage. Ba boundary, oh, did I just lose it? And boundaries manage. It's okay, I got a loud voice. Um, think about that, where silos end and boundaries vanish. The pace of change in emerging economies around the world, and particularly in Delhi and Mumbai, boggles the mind. And in two of the university visits, one to Shid Nadar University, another to Geo Institute, hopefully next year, Jeff, they'll send students here, um, I had the chance to see how they're educating tomorrow's leaders. They're investing in technology, they're recognizing the need for digital transformation, they're looking at new interdisciplinary majors. And you can, can you notice the difference? Okay, interdisciplinary majors. And yet, at the same time, of the people that are in this country who are moving ahead at an incredible pace, it also felt like they're leaving a lot of people <coughs> behind. And the same was true in Africa. And here's the thing. Education is the one link that really is necessary to leave no one behind. And I got to speak at a conference as the higher ed trade delegate and it was hosted by Tata's chairman of the board of Tata Power. And they're doing some amazing things on trying to access clean energy. Um, and we dialogued with leaders in the sciences and business and the arts on what does it take to create access to those left behind. And how critically is it how critically important it is for students to have this global perspective. I am inspired by the commitment of our teachers and our business leaders, but I also know we have a long way to go. The attention to environment, wealth gaps, thoughtful economic growth, and building sustainability in communities from that ESG perspective is more important than ever. Many talk about it, but we need to look at it globally. We need to have an appreciation for the geopolitical challenges ahead of us. And let's face it, when have you looked at a local paper that talked about what was happening in Africa and India? Now, if you're from the CBA and you're reading the Financial Times like you're supposed to, the answer is probably, well, we are doing some of that, Dale. Anyway, what's the good news? Our students are taking steps, and the case presentations I know you will all be presenting, um, it's going to impress the heck out of uh, AV industry experts or so as they hear from this generation. You guys give me hope. Anyway, prepare to be inspired. So let me close with this. There is real urgency in our global community, and global sustainability is really just the tip of the iceberg. Tomorrow's future needs all of us. It needs the educators, the business leaders, and tomorrow's employees. As the dean of CBA, we have a mission statement. You'll see it in the Hilton lobby if you haven't visited yet. And it says that we advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global community. And those words resonate with me every day as they capture what our common home, this planet, needs. And more importantly, the voices that need to be heard. You'll hear those voices tonight with our guest speaker. You'll also hear them from all of you and each other in the competition. So I just want to say on behalf of the college and LMU, thank you for all you do, for caring, and most importantly, for making action and strategy part of your contributions to this planet we share. 
the world needs you. Thank you so much, Dean Smith. Uh, we are honored this evening to have this event and our, our evening together sponsored by the Center for International Business Education. And I would like to invite Dr. Young to share a few minutes, a few words with us. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Young Sung Pat. I'm the director of the Center for International Business Education. So I'd like to welcome all of you here tonight, this evening, students and faculty, and maybe there's some of the guests that uh, accompany you. So we are very proud of sponsoring this event uh, since 2018, when we received a, a very prestigious cyber grants for the first time. And we can continue to support in this kind of event because it really aligned with the LNU school mission which to raise the whole person based on the faith and justice. And as our Dean mentioned, also the College of Business Administration's uh, mission to try to develop business leaders uh, with a moral courage and creative confidence to be a force in a global, uh, force for good uh, in a global business community. So I know there are some other schools that who run this very similar international business competitions uh, to the best of my knowledge, um, LMU is the very few school actually that exclusively focused on international business case competition on the issue of ethics and uh, sustainability. So I know that you know a lot of companies now are facing increasing challenges uh, when they're conducting their businesses across borders uh, due to the differences uh, in institution both formal and informal institutions. So um, I think that it will be very critical for the companies to continue to be engaged in the ethical behavior to continue to survive the competition in the global market. And they realize that's the, probably the only um, you know, sustainable way to continue to remain in, in the global community to be a, a valid company. So I wish you all um, in this competition and hopefully this will be a great learning experience, all of you. And um, you can take these lessons when you become the you know, real practitioners after your graduation. So good luck, everyone, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pick. Now, here's what our plan is for the evening. We're really aware that you have all traveled great distances to be with us tonight. We've got folks from Cleveland and from Washington, D.C. area, and then New York, and, and that's really far east, but then we've got Nova Scotia, and they know what far east is from us, et cetera, from Spain. But we know that you've traveled great distance. So our, our plan tonight is to really be inspired by corporate practice in the areas of sustainability and learn about that. <clears throat> We're going to have a couple of our faculty members reflect briefly on, on really what struck them in, in terms of the presentation we're having this evening. But our aim is to be done with that portion by about 7 o'clock. And then we're going to have a time to talk a little bit about the logistics of the competition and also have the opportunity for you to meet one another. Um, because networking and building your global network is a real important value of what this competition is. So what I'd like to do first is introduce our speakers and then uh, have our keynote join us. <coughs> We're deeply honored to have Dan Goldenberg, uh, former Vice President, uh, Head of Sustainability and Vice President of CSR and ESG for Activision Blizzard. Dan served in that role and all, while also leading the Call of Duty endowment. Dan is a retired Navy mm -hmm. captain, has two decades of business experience and 27 years of active and reserve <laughs> military service, including a Senior Vice President at Frost & Sullivan, and prior to that, as a senior director and practice manager at CEV, now Gardner. Highlights of his military service include four tours as commanding officer, carrier-based naval flight officer, intelligence officer, and special assistant to four secretaries of the Navy, John Dalton, Richard Danzing, Robin Perry, and Gordon England. Under Dan's leadership, 
Activision Blizzard entered the top quartile of America's greenest companies, Newsweek, and the Call of Duty endowment rose to become the world's largest philanthropic funder of veteran employment, backing more than 130,000 high-quality job placements at 119th the cost per placement of the U.S. Department of Labor efforts, and achieving nearly $8 billion in economic impact for veterans and their families. In 2021, Dan founded and assumed leadership for Activision Blizzard's corporate social responsibility function, which included environmental, social, and governance reporting. Through his leadership, the company calculated and disclosed its full carbon footprint, becoming the first pure play video game to do so, while embarking on a dozen mitigation efforts to achieve science-based target initiative aligned net zero goals. Also, during his tenure, the endowment won more than 30 national awards, including four Engage the Good Halo Awards, two YouTube streamings, a Clio, and Fast Company's World Changing Ideas Award. He also serves on the Bush Institute's Advisory Board and the USAA's Educational Foundation Board of Governors. Dan is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy, National Intelligence University, Harvard Business School, MIT's Chief Sustainability Officer Program, and the Air Command and Staff College. From his military service, he holds several individual and campaign awards, including the Defense Superior Service Medal. We're deeply honored to have Dan with us this evening. Joining him for some observations after Dan's presentation will be two faculty members from Loyola Marymount. First, Dr. Melissa Fitzpatrick. Mm -hmm. Melissa is an assistant professor of ethics and sustainability in the College of Business Administration at LNU. She received her PhD in philosophy from Boston College just before starting her previous position as an assistant professor of practice and ethics, teaching the Portico program in Boston College's Carroll School of Management. Her role at the Carroll School was to introduce incoming students to philosophy as a lived practice, while gu guiding them toward an understanding of business as a force for good and a vehicle of change. We're proud that before her doctorate, she earned a master's in philosophy from LMU and her BS in communication from Boston University. Melissa is the co-author of Radical Hospitality from Thought to Action. Chief among her research interests is understanding how to foster a more sustainable community with the other than human world, and as a vital foundation for that, how to overcome instrumental values. Her work in normative ethics focuses on the intersection of post-Kantian continental philosophy and contemporary virtue ethics, arguing for the significance of self-disruption in ethical development. She has also done integrated teaching, research, and community outreach in free college philosophy in the Mississippi Delta and on the Mexican-American border in El Paso, Texas. Dr. Jung Hoon Park is an assistant professor of strategic management at Loyola Marymount University. His, expert, his, his research expertise focuses on global sustainability strategy, driven by a strong interest in exploring how firms can design and implement strategies to tackle pressing sustainability issues, such as climate change and public health efficiencies. He studies the reciprocal relationship between strategy and sustainability in two main areas, how firms design and implement strategies to advance sustainability and how sustainability issues affect firm strategies. He earned his PhD from the Graduate Center in Baruch College City University of New York. Um, we're really honored to have these stellar uh, presenters with us this evening and to have our keynote, Dan Goldenberg. Thank you so much, Dan. Well, it's really, really inspiring to be here. I've lived in Los Angeles for 11 years now. And um, while many of the problems facing us, especially in the sustainability world, uh, can be daunting, one useful thing uh, one useful perspective you can gain from this beautiful campus is looking out over there, the city. Had you been here 40 years ago, you wouldn't have been able to see those buildings because of the smog here. And in California, we took actions that ultimately led the nation to reduce very harmful emissions uh, that have really made our air a lot better here. And now because of that, we have such a beautiful venue here where we can see out into what goodness looks like in that regard. So um, thank you 
Dean for having me. I really appreciate it, Dean Smith. We, I appreciated your remarks uh, a lot. They resonated uh, with me deeply. And uh, looking out here, this is a generation of future business leaders and leaders in other realms uh, that are probably going to be amongst the first to reject the Milton Friedman-esque approach to business, which is the business of business is business, for those of you who haven't heard that before. It's a really outmoded way of thinking, in my opinion. There are people, business leaders, who do not agree with that. Uh, I acknowledge that, but I think they're very much out of step, and I think your generation is going to be the one that, that really, truly changes that once and, once and for all. Um, Jeff, again, where, where do you, there you are, right there in front of me. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Um, Melissa, looking forward uh, to talk with you and Jung Hoon uh, later on afterwards. Um, this is going to be a pretty casual conversation. Uh, I really don't mind if in the middle of it something hits you and you want you want to comment or, or ask a question, feel free, or you want to wait till the end, that's fine too. I'm sure we'll have plenty of time for that. Um, and speaking of time, uh, Jeff told me he wanted me to speak for about half an hour. And it reminded me of a time when I was invited to speak uh, you, you probably caught on. I, I, I was in the Navy for quite some time, and I, I was given a big honor to speak at a retirement ceremony, which is a big deal in the Navy. Uh, and it was a retirement ceremony for a senior chief petty officer. That's a very senior enlisted rank in, in, the, in the U.S. Navy. Um, and so for an officer to be asked to speak to a senior enlisted uh, member's retirement, that's a big deal. And on top of that, the retirement was on a ship, the USS Constitution. Uh, true, true fact. Um, it is the oldest commission warship in the world, in Boston Harbor. Go see it if you get a chance, um, from the age of sail. So here I am, I was pretty nervous. I, I had this great honor to speak at this important person's retirement ceremony aboard the most historic warship uh, in, in the United States. And I knew I, whatever I did, I, I couldn't screw it up. So I, I put a lot of work into this. Um, I, I really focused on my remarks and I, finally the day came, I got up there and I'm, I'm talking. And I just feel like I'm hitting my stride. Everything's going the way I had planned it. Uh, and I'm, I'm just in the middle of it. Things are going great. And all of a sudden, this junior petty officer in the middle of the, the audience stands up and starts walking out. And I was taken aback for a second. Definitely threw me off my stride. And I just said, excuse me, petty officer. Can I ask you, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm going to get a haircut. And I said, after I kind of got my composure back, um, can I ask why you didn't get a haircut before this event? He said, well, sir, before you started speaking, I didn't need a haircut. So I'm going to try and keep this uh, within the realm and uh, not cause anyone to go to the barbershop. OK. Um, so I've been asked to talk about ESG and, and with a focus on sustainability in the video game industry. Um, been at that work uh, in the industry for, for a decade. And um, I, th I think it might be useful to kind of ground uh, this conversation in the audience. So show of hands, if you regularly play video games, say at least once a week, raise your hand. Looks like maybe about 40% of the room. Okay. Uh, they'll admit it, right. <laughs> um, so um, not surprising as two thirds of Americans play video games regularly. And they spend, or last year, they spent $56 billion in that pursuit. That's just in the United States. Um, that's six times what they spent on going to the movies, to give you a sense. Um, and despite what you might think uh, from recent March, the, the incredible March Madness, right? I think for those of you who are sports fans, pretty incredible season. Um, the game industry is actually bigger than the, the National Football League, Major League Baseball, the National Basketball Association, and the National Hockey League combined, okay? Just to give you a sense, it, it's, it's this quiet industry in some ways, in other ways not, uh, but it's substantial. And um, the annual growth rate for this industry is predicted uh, in the next few years, the CAGR, to be about 10%. So it's a big industry and it's still growing pretty, pretty aggressively. Um, all that's to say, what happens in gaming matters. Matters more than, than po folks who might not be gamers realize. Um, and I think the ESG aspects of the industry are little by little taking more center stage, but they should have taken center stage a long time ago because of the size and scope of this, this industry. Um, 
And in the face of this, stakeholders are demanding more, not less information from the, the industry on RESG practices. And to be honest with you, and I can say this now because um, I, I stepped out away from my role a week and a half ago, so I, I'm a free agent now. Um, for many years, the industry has really lagged um, other industries in our reporting practices. Um, and, you know, more recently, there has been a lot of interest in the S part, the social aspect of ESG in the video game industry for a lot of reasons. Um, and good reasons. I think we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. But I'll submit to you that a lot more attention needs to be paid to the E, to the environmental part of what this fast growing industry is doing. Um, so I'll start by first giving the social part of ESG its due. Having been responsible for reporting on a public company's ESG uh, transactions, um, worked very closely with our human resources, our diversity, equity, and inclusion teams to get the information out there that I think is reasonable of, of companies to disclose. Um, there is an increasing expectation of transparency among stakeholders, probably leading amongst them employees. Um, I, I think there's fewer, there are very few industries where you have such an activist employee population as you do in the video game sector. And I think that's important to acknowledge and that's been a driver of a lot of our disclosures in this regard. Um, a lot of expectations around transparency, uh, specifically on gender and racial diversity, equity, inclusion, and even more specifically in pay and promotion rates as they apply to those categories. And it's very appropriate. Um, also on the social component, as someone, it was, it was mentioned, uh, who's led a corporate charitable function, a corporate charitable foundation. Um, many companies in the industry would do well to focus on achieving measurable social impact um, rather than the anecdotal feel good efforts that we see quite, quite uh, prominently across, across the stage. So this notion of serious philanthropic giving that drives serious measurable um, social impact is, is super important and I think lost in the lights. Uh, as an example, in the case of our foundation, the Call of Duty Endowment, we knew that every cent we received from the company and from our stakeholders and from our donors and from our, our gamers uh, went to placing veterans in jobs because the company covered all of our operating costs. That, that's pretty unusual and it was a really, really great model. Um, that is what enabled us to hit those numbers that um, Jeff mentioned, 130,000 vets and jobs. By the way, to give you a sense of how big that is, that's about two thirds the size of the US Marine Corps. So it, it was substantial. Um, and last year alone, 17,000 veterans into high quality jobs. And that was done, as Jeff mentioned, for uh, about 20 times more efficiently than the federal government's efforts. I tell you this, not to brag, but simply to say that the gaming industry is capable of driving outside and meaningful social impact to the communities it serves when it applies itself using its unique people and resources to a, a social problem. Okay. So that's social. Now into the meat of the, the matter, environmental. Um, as I said before, it has not received enough attention here, not enough focus, but yet there's plenty of opportunity to make great strides here. This is a tough space. Sustainability is a tough space. Leading sustainability and sustainability reporting is really tough. Um, I, I was talking with Dean Smith earlier and the, the analogy I use um, it, it may be a little trite, but I, I do believe it's true. It's building the ship while sailing, while the plans change and you're being chased by pirates. Sorry, I'm a sailor. I gotta bring my nautical metaphors in here. Um, but it, it's true, right? Because companies, especially given the, the CSRD regulations coming out of Europe, um, which are for sure leading the globe uh, and are sucking many large companies into them, and that's appropriate. Um, are requiring us to report on things that we don't fully understand as companies with metrics that we often don't have confidence in. That is an unnatural act for public companies to do that. You have to understand that public companies, um, the CFOs have been brought up for the last 20, what, 25 years, 20 years, um, due to Sarbanes-Oxley rules, that if they get their public filings wrong, they can go to jail. They can go to jail. So into that mix, you now have mandates 
to report um, numbers, report quantitatively on sustainability progress, that, that's a little scary, right? Before the numbers are, 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 are before the underlying um, ability to collect that data has really, really been assured and is really um, based on a premise that we can be confident in. One thing CFOs haven't had to worry about is their numbers pretty pretty well baked at this point, right? They how, The methodologies for how we get to financial metrics for companies are very well understood. And I would argue they are not for sustainability. We'll talk about that a little more. Um, so this is a tough space. Um, we've learned a lot. And what I really want to get across to you tonight um, is, is three lessons and that we'll each go into in some depth. First, environmental targets matter. However, a plan to achieve them matters more. Second, avoid guessing. Pursue actual emissions data before making large commitments based on lowest common denominator estimated numbers. It might sound jargony to you. I promise you'll understand by the time we're done. Third, partner meaningfully with employees to achieve truly remarkable sustainability improvements. So those are our three lessons for tonight. Okay, let's start with targets. Like I said, not much has been asked of the industry in this regard, and it's a shame. The industry has much to do, um, but there just hasn't been much stakeholder pressure, and really I'm talking about investors and employees to a certain extent, and gamers. There just hasn't been much pressure on them to set these targets. Um, and, and companies that are comfortable with that do so at their own peril, because the longer they wait to, dis to set targets, and disclose their progress against them, the harder it's gonna to be to mitigate emissions by that critical 2050 date. And I think most of you know what I'm talking about, but if not, 2050 is the date by which we're trying to achieve global net zero and limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, now, um, there's been a lot of talk lately that we're, <laughs> we're not gonna get there. Um, there's a lot, a lot of concern and, and valid concern. I just spent a year studying this problem at MIT and um, I, have, I have very serious doubts, but it doesn't mean we need to stop trying. Quite the contrary, we need to accelerate our efforts. Um, but companies that wait till they're absolutely forced to do it and wait for every element of the requirements to be spelled out do so at their own peril, it's only gonna get harder. Um, one saving grace, I mentioned CSRD, the European re regulations that are, that are really driving the, the train globally. Um, these will force some progress. For the video game industry, this only, really this, this only really motivates behavior change in the biggest companies, unfortunately, at this time, and those based in Europe. But it's a start, and it may pull the rest of the industry along, and that's a good thing. Um, I do worry, though, that many companies in the industry are either not very engaged, as I've alluded to, uh, or they're focused more on the optics of sustainability than meaningfully reducing emissions. The current approach is kind of like watering that cute sapling, you know, the one that's in every sustainability deck, the little green sapling that's coming up, um, but you're doing it while the surrounding forest is on fire. They're focusing on the wrong stuff. For hey, let me give you an example of this um, in, in the gaming industry. Focusing on, th there are companies that are focusing on using on uh, reducing end user emissions. So focusing on the device, the, the PC, the mobile phone, the console, right? F uh, on the end user emissions. Um, that's interesting and it seems like the right thing to do, right? It seems to make sense. Um, but if you look at the numbers, and we have, the far bigger problems stem from video game marketing and digital distribution of games. That's where the emissions are really, the big emissions are really coming from. These are much less sexy, but much more consequential. And the massive amount of, of energy used for these purposes, which is growing, um, is just not well understood or accounted for in terms of amount or sources of electricity. So it's of critical importance for companies in the industry to not only publicly commit to achievable emissions reduction targets, but also ensure they're accompanied by realistic plans on how to get there that address the right sources of emissions. Okay, 
That's a good segue into data. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you two stories that I think will hopefully illustrate the problem with data because target's well and good, but if the underlying data to measure progress against them isn't there, we have a real problem. So a number of years ago when we did our first environmental inventory, looking at measuring the company's carbon footprint, we partnered with a world-class consulting firm that you all know. By the way, if you want to ask me who they are offline, happy to tell you. They were amazing. They did a great job. I'd hire them again in a second. Um, we, we, we started this work, this first environmental inventory of the company. Uh, and to my knowledge at the time, it may have been the first comprehensive environmental inventory of a pure play video game company. Um, but they were great. They had a lot of experience in, this, in the environmental inventory space, albeit not in the video game space. And so before we kicked off the engagement or when we kicked it off, we said, hey, let's hypothesize where we think the emissions are gonna come from. And we, we actually agreed. We said, you know, it's video games. We don't, we don't make chemicals. We don't make jet airplanes. We, do, we don't make consumer product. We, we, make electro, we send electrons out over the internet, right? So our assumption was 80% of our emissions would be uh, coming from data centers and public cloud. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know, public cloud, that's effectively data center services offered by big companies like Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. Um, so that was, that was our uh, hypothesis. Um, so we kicked it off and uh, we, four months later, we got the numbers back and we could not have been more wrong. So combined data centers and public cloud amounted 12% of our emissions, 12%, that's it. And so the moral of the story is before you run off, and, and I've heard leaders in other companies, uh, sustainability leaders say, you know, it's more important you just do something, you just get going. I've heard the same thing in philanthropy too, by the way, which I utterly disagree with. Um, no, you need to have your facts straight. You need to have your data right. It's worth the investment. Make the investment in knowing from where you're starting. Super, super important. Um, it's so easy to go down the wrong path to invest millions or tens of millions of dollars in people's time, talent, and treasure on the wrong mitigation strategy if your data is not correct. Okay, so once you've done that and you have that fact-based inventory, then obviously you can start building targets that make sense and are credible and achievable. SBTI, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, that's the gold standard, by the way. Um, I, especially if I was an investor, I would not trust any company's targets unless they had the SBTI uh, stamp on them. Um, having been, having submitted to the process, I can tell you how rigorous it is. Um, you cannot BS S SBTI. Your target's gotta be real and you have to have a plan to get there. And speaking of which, um, if you have the credible data and the credible targets, now you can obviously make a plan, right? I talked about the importance of, of having a credible plan. And the way to do that, because you have numbers you trust, is you start with the biggest numbers and where there's opportunities to mitigate the, those sources of emissions, that's where you should focus. Um, not from the most visible, but from the biggest achievable gains that can be made. Um, unfortunately, I, I still see many companies in the industry focusing on the visible, the easy, not the big, hard, hard things. A lot of talk about sequestration, you know, carbon sequestration technology, um, you know, it's going to save us or geoengineering is going to save us or carbon offsets. Mm -hmm. At this point, if you don't have that other stuff right, those things are largely distractions in my opinion. I will tell you in the, uh, on the job, probably on any given week, three or four different vendors reach out to me trying to sell our company carbon offsets. With no understanding about how companies that, whose targets are subject to SBTI actually um, actually meet those targets, right? The fact of the matter is if you've com you're complying with SBTI, um, you can't use carbon offsets till you've mitigated 90% of your uh, scope three emissions and 95% of your scope one and two emissions. And I should take a minute uh, here. I, I can't assume everyone knows what I'm talking about with scope one, two, and three. Scope one emissions, uh, these are direct emissions. So in the video game industry, the fuel we burn for our backup diesel generators for our buildings where our devs are, are coding games like Call of Duty. Um, scope two, that's our electricity bill. Indirect, but that's fun functionally what it mounts to us. Scope three, this is our value chain. These are indirect emissions that are not in our direct control. Um, like 
all tech companies and all video game companies, north of 90% of our emissions are scope three. So it's just good for you to know that our company in our last inventory, 95% of our emissions were scope three. So all those lovely efforts to turn the lights off and stuff like that in the building, important, but doesn't really move the dial to getting us to net zero as a company. Um, okay, uh, so um, the, those other things I mentioned, carbon sequestration technology, geoengineering, offsets, important for the future for sure, but probably for the video game industry, not the most relevant area uh, to be spending our time right now. Um, and again, I see many in the industry talking about what they're doing in that regard. Uh, and when they do, especially with offsets, I sent them that John Oliver clip. I don't know if any of you have seen John Oliver's clip about offsets, but it's, it's worth watching. It, it, it definitely takes the wind out of the sails of people who are uh, pushing offsets, especially ones that aren't high quality. Um, so the bottom line is even with the best of intentions, it's easy to pursue the wrong mitigation efforts if you don't have your data straight. Let me give you another example. Um, public cloud, as I mentioned that earlier, right? Our first year doing it, public cloud and data centers together were 12% of our emissions. 8% of that was public cloud. Um, and we did, how do we get that number? Very, very important question to ask. Is where, did the, where did the data come from? Well, we did, um, something called a spend-based analysis. It's totally acceptable under the greenhouse gas protocols. It's something that almost every company does to get their scope three emissions down because it's easy. You, it, this is how it works. You figure out for each of the categories under scope three, how much you're spending. So for instance, how much did we spend on public cloud? Then you go into a government database in the US, it's called the US Department, excuse me, US Environmental Protection Agency's EEIO, their, their, their database. And you look at public cloud and it says for every dollar of public cloud spending, this equates to X greenhouse gas emissions. You multiply, that's called an emissions factor. You multiply that times your spend, boom, you have your, your scope three emissions for the category. Great, right? Done. And so when we followed that approach that first year, that's how we came to 8% of our emissions were being, uh, were due to public cloud. Um, the next year, however, I pushed the team to go hard for actual emissions, wherever we could find them. So we went to Google, we went to Amazon, we went to Microsoft uh, and a couple other providers. And we said, we wanna know our actual emissions that were attributed to the business we did with you in public cloud. So when we added all that up, it was 2%. It went from 8% to 2%. We were off by a factor of four. Our numbers that are acceptable to, to international standards, to the greenhouse gas protocols, to our auditors, we're off by a factor of four. Tell me what other reported area for a business where, where, the, where that would be okay, right? That's, that's kind of the world we're in, right? And can you imagine what it wastes? 8%, that's material for a company. That's enough where we say, okay, we're gonna devote significant time, talent, and treasure to solve this problem, right? Can you imagine if we'd done that, if we'd focused on that, we would, have, we would have gone in the wrong direction and wasted time, precious time. Um, and fortunately we didn't do that. And we were able to reallocate the second year when we were more confident in our data to the most pressing issues. And that's those 12, um, those 12 areas that were alluded to in the introduction, the, the, those were the more highly resourced ones. Um, that's not to say we abandoned public cloud, 2%, it's not a huge amount, but it, what, what we did do is focus l lesser resources, lower priority resources on addressing public cloud. So um, the bottom line is data is really important to getting the right strategy to, to reducing your emissions as a company. Um, and the moral is don't bet on weak data assumptions when planning the mitigation of emissions, even if the regulations say it's okay. You have to question assumptions and you have to pursue actual, not estimated data. Okay, final area in the home stretch here. Employees. In this work, as you probably guessed from me, it's easy to become numbers obsessed. And that's not totally wrong, by the way, but it does come with apparel. Um, there's a wonderful woman on my team, or was on my team, uh, Jessica, who would always tell me when I, when I started really hammering on the numbers, she'd say, don't forget the people. Don't forget the people. 
Um, she's what I'd call a cultural warrior in the company. Culture, you know, as the old saying goes, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? And it's so true in sustainability. Um, and so it's critical to get both right. And if you want good data and you want mitigation efforts that are gonna work, you need to engage your people. On the right data front, for companies with large scope three emissions, uh, the conventional wisdom is, hey, just partner with supply chain and that's good to go. And that's true. But the numbers will guide you to saying, well, actually, there may be other areas of the company where you have to go to find this, this data. Uh, and it's incredibly helpful, we found, to work with internal audit, finance, digital supply chain, marketing and sales. Um, so we needed to make friends and educate folks in those spaces to really get to high quality numbers. On the mitigation side, now you're taking it up a notch, right? You're asking employees not just to provide information, but to take action. A higher level of commitment is required here, right? And to get there, you need real cultural engagement. Uh, it, it's important, I think, to form a core group of advocates within the company. You can't expect all employees to get this, but many companies have, for, have started to form things they call green teams. But this core group of people across the business who are really passionate about sustainability and can be your assets. Like, like many companies, our sustainability team was quite small. We couldn't do it by ourselves, and we needed to extend our reach through that method. Um, in both the data and, and emissions mitigation context, you need to invest in these employees to get there. You have to bring them along with regular progress updates and training. If you do that, they in turn will bring you ideas that your small team might not have considered otherwise. That's been the case for us. Um, and you have to make it personal. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, we partnered, oh, I'll just say it, I'll give them a shout out. Local company here, startup, great company called The Carbonauts. And they're focused on helping transform employee culture, getting employees more engaged in sustainability. And one of the first things they do is the employees you have who, who, participating, they do a personal carbon footprint calculator. Who here has done that? Who here, raise your hand if you've done a personal carbon footprint calculator. Looks like about half the room. Everybody should do this, do it. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you my story with it. I went in there, I did this thing, and I, I thought I am gonna have a low carbon footprint. I've got panels on my roof, I've got an electric car, I have high efficiency appliances. We are a sustainably minded family. I was shocked when I got the results back about how unsustainable I was living because 90% of my personal emissions were business travel. So this personal engagement changed my business thinking. It made me think about how I was behaving as a business person uh, and change my behavior on, on business travel. Can you imagine every employee doing something like that and bringing personal insights to the, the workplace that can really engage them? It works very, very well. Um, so making it personal really does drive engagement. Um, now, I, I talked about prioritization of efforts. Um, ultimately, let the numbers guide you, but they will guide you to places and parts of the company you might not normally work with. People are always surprised to say, my, my best friend function in the company has been internal audit. Internal audit has helped us, um, structure, helped us structure a system where we could really track our goals and data in a way that would be passable to auditors in the future, because we believed, and we turned out to be right, that that requirement to have audited numbers for your sustainability efforts uh, is coming. It's here for European companies and companies subject to CSRD, and it eventually will be here for American companies that aren't subject to CSRD as well because of the new SEC requirements. So, you know, it's the make strange bedfellows kind of, kind of work. But um, when you find those people who are aligned to your priorities with sustainability, um, you do need to cultivate them. And for us, again, marketing, digital supply chain, sales, finance, workplace, IT. These are the folks that I wouldn't have considered having to work with at the beginning, and now they've become really tied in. And one of the beautiful things I found is there's a real hunger from employees in these functions to get involved with sustainability, which creates a real virtuous cycle. Um, so bottom line is hard to overstate how important it is uh, for success to invest in these folks. Okay, summary for tonight, three lessons. Targets matter, a plan to achieve them matters more. Second, avoid guessing. Pursue actual emissions data before making large commitments of resources, time, talent, and treasure. And finally, um, partner meaningfully with employees to achieve the sustainability outcomes you desire. 
so that's it for me tonight. Um, I guess over to, uh, let's see, Jeff, Melissa, uh, and where's, oh, Jung Hoon, there it is. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights um, about the Blizzard's uh, activism and activism Blizzard's ESG activities and the implications. Um, so I'm not sure whether you are familiar with Korea. So I was born and raised in Korea. Um, growing up in Korea, I used to play a lot of Blizzard's games, including StarCraft, Warcraft, uh, Diablo, uh, and recent, more recent like Overwatch, the shooting game. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I, feel, I started feeling guilty because I sort of contributed to the Korea's like high greenhouse gas emissions level uh, because uh, that, as Dan pointed out, it sort of aligns with the concept of scope number scope three, which is the indirect emissions emissions for the company. Um, so, um, I so building upon Dan's insights, I sort of reflected upon two parts in terms of the role of managers uh, in promoting sustainability. So the first part is about the plan, like choose the right plan. After you set up your targets, like for greenhouse gas emissions, but I think at the more, more importantly, you need to sort of think of how to sort of reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. But as a manager, they might find it really challenging to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's not just about technical, like a technological solutions, but you also need to sort of change the organization culture as Dan pointed out. And then sometimes there might be lack of like a top management team support for sustainability issues, because sometimes you could easily prioritize like a profitability issues. Um, and there are like other issues that might hamper, like hinder the firm's efforts at dealing with the greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. So, Given that there's no like legal mandate about uh, setting up greenhouse gas emission like targets, so co sometimes companies can probably just can easily adjust the uh, GHG target. Um, let's say, oh, by 2030 we are going to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 20 percent, but they can easily adjust, adjust it to 10 percent or 15 percent. And some companies, especially in the oil and gas sector, some companies might engage in like divestitures. Um, when they try to improve upon their environmental performance at the firm level. Oh, here's our polluting asset, uh, but I don't think it's part of our business portfolio at all. So we are going to just dispose of these polluting assets to another company, especially private companies that necessarily don't have the same responsibility to disclose their information to the public. So Dan's point about choosing the sort of right plan to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions and then probably achieve your environmental targets you need the right sort of strategy uh, to achieve that. So that's something that I was reflecting upon. And then the second part is, is the prioritization of your efforts. Um, when we have been talking about ESG a lot, and then I have been actually puzzled about what actually adds, especially as part, like, a con like constitutes. Is it about like a pay or equal pay, or is it about DEI, or is it about some health concerns? Is it about your like a company's relationship with local community members? But as Dan pointed out, like the gaming company might focus on like DEI issues and maybe equal pay. So maybe as a manager, we might need to, um, regardless of those inconsistencies across like ESG rating companies frameworks, especially what, uh, in terms of what constitutes ESG, we might need to probably think about as a manager, uh, what is material to my company uh, and then what, what can we do uh, in terms of like ES and G uh, through our strategic management. So that's the two, those are the two points that I was reflecting upon. And uh, thanks again for sharing your insights. Thanks. Thank you both. Can you guys hear me okay? Does this work? I'm also very loud, so <laughs> I don't know if I need it. So I wanna thank Dan so much for your interesting talk. I've not played video games since Nintendo 64, so I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit I'm not quite the clientele, um, but I kind of miss it. I want to come back to video games a little bit after thinking about this, but I respect and appreciate the industry for what it is and learned a lot from your talk, so thank you for that. So as a philosopher or an ethicist by training, I think about many of these things through a theoretical lens, so it's always invaluable to really dig into tangible cases of how this plays out in the market and companies being brave enough 
to evoke meaningful change, which is not easy to do. So one comment that you made that struck me and really frustrates me actually regularly is that industry has the ability to operate so much more sustainably than it already does, um, but it doesn't. Favoring optics over substance, as philosophers put it, images over reality. <laughs> um, it's so hard for me to wrap my head around that because we're closer to midnight than ever before. I won't get too dramatic though about that, but easier said than done. Because when you have a huge list of things to do and stakeholders aren't demanding it, it makes it hard to stick to that, though that is of course changing, right? So one quick thing, I've mentioned this in my classes, um, I was fortunate enough to attend the United Nations Conference of the Parties conference in Dubai. So this was huge where they kind of work on the Paris Treaty and see what they're hitting. This is thanks to LMU and to Dean Smith and CBA for funding me to go. But as someone who does business ethics, there's a huge message they made there that I thought was so important to bring back to my students and to the college. The biggest opportunity to scale change comes from the private sector, and that's just a fact. Everyone at the conference knew that. There were leaders in business that were stressing that over and over again. Why is that the case? Because businesses have resources, tons of money. They also have insane innovators that are not afraid to push the bar in what they do. And they can also act fast and the time is ripe for those sorts of leaders. So that was exciting to hear um, and I hope the pressure keeps coming. So I really appreciated Dan's point about the need to understand the whole scope of the impact and what the impact really is in order to affect real change. We're part of markets that rely on society, which relies on a healthy biosphere. So the SDGs pyramid shows us this so wonderfully. Without the earth, the rest is bust. <laughs> There's nothing else we can do. Um, the sort of information companies need to gather can be really difficult to get and also really disturbing to process, but it's required to provoke the kind of innovation that real entrepreneurs absolutely can and should be partaking in. So ethically speaking, it's this entrepreneurial mindset grounded in social and environmental aims as goods that ought to be protected for their own sake, as intrinsically valuable that will save us. I truly do believe in that. As these are people, entrepreneurs, who really are willing to think outside of the norms and innovating for the sake of values that should not be transgressed. So I also took note of your point that it requires a real fight to get the information you need to make meaningful change. So that shows how much energy and will there needs to be from leaders who also have, to quote the CBA mission again, moral courage. Knowing the right road isn't the easy road, but doing it anyway, and actually trusting in the ability to problem solve with an eye toward the good, which is something that any company and really any person can do if they want to. So you said the moral is don't bet on weak assumptions when pursuing mitigation, mitigating emissions, even if regulations permit, question assumptions. This is philosophy 101. So the philosopher in me got really excited with this and pursue actual not estimated data. This is vital in theory becoming practice, the, that part of ethics that's so interesting to me. It needs to be grounded in reality, no matter how hard that reality can be to swallow, truth is worth it. And again, this is sort of what philosophy brings us back to. So the last thing I wanna reflect on is the green team. I love this idea. And I think about it a lot in relation to other sustainable companies like Patagonia. I just read their latest book that they put out on how the company has been successful in the last 50 years, just to give one example. What they stress over and over again there, as Dan did, is their Enviro team is absolutely essential. They literally turn to them in the hard moments and say, guide us, <laughs> tell us what to do. Because these are the people that actually look at how things are done, conducting internal and external audits. And in the case of Patagonia, and I'm sure Dan experienced this himself, if those teams, team members were not on the ground, things really did fall apart. So this is really exciting because as someone who works on how to overcome instrumental and almost exclusively profit-driven thinking, I love to think about a line of work in corporations that focuses on instilling core principles, that that's what the people do at every step along the way. And of course, this requires a lot of knowledge about environmental management and science, but with a view toward the good. That's kind of the ethics part of it, a more sustainable world, science and data needs values. This is something that we're kind of learning the hard way, but Dan's talk really emphasized that. So this is essential to safeguarding the culture, which eats strategy for breakfast, <laughs> of a new way of doing business and not allowing companies to fall back into an uninspired business as usual. 
This is such an invaluable line of work that I think those who care about ethics and sustainability and shaping and instilling vital values to protect the future can actually pursue, which is awesome. So thank you so very much for your talk.